everybody, my name is William Weston and uh, I'm coming to you tonight to talk about God's Word preserved through the ages. God's Word has been communicated to men through in times past, through prophets, uh, through dreams, but the main way that he communicates with people is through the Bible. And the Bible is the, the way that God communicates to us uh, what He wants us to do, uh, what He wants us to understand about His world, uh, how to be saved through Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, next. Uh, this is the King James Version. It is still the best translation of the Bible. I'm not going to give you a lot of the emotional uh, arguments. I'm going to just stick strictly with the facts. The King James Bible is based on an unbroken line of thousands of manuscripts that are accurately and reliably copied by competent scribes. Now there's modern English Bibles like uh, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, uh, the Living Bible. Uh, they have very good translations of the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament is those books that start with Genesis, uh, go through the uh, histories, First uh, and Second Samuel and ends with the uh, prophets like Malachi. Very good translations, all of them. They're just efficient when it comes to the New Testament because they rely on defective manuscripts. The New Testament are those books that start with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and end with Revelation. Uh, let's talk about how God uh, speaks of preserving his word in his word. Uh, Psalm 12, 6 and 7 uh, says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So God's words are preserved from for all time. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And then uh, Jesus is speaking in uh, Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So what does it mean, uh, the jot and the tittle? Uh, here we have a, on the right a jot. It is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It is also the, uh, the uh, iota which is in the Greek, uh, the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. And look at the right-hand side, there, there's two letters there, the bet, which stands for the letter, or the sound B, and cap, which is the sound st stands for the letter K, but they're very similar in appearance except for uh, at the right-hand lower corner, there's a little tail to the uh, bet, and the calf does not have that little tail. So it's very important that every jot and every tittle be preserved in God's Word uh, in order so that uh, we have no misunderstandings about what God is talking about. So, uh, uh, so how did he preserve his word through the centuries? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one way to... Uh, now, we're going to be talking about how 
scribes make copies. There are two different ways that scribes will make copies. The first way uh, they could do it is the dictation method. The dictation method, uh, you would have a senior scribe or dictator uh, will have the exemplar text or the authentic copy from which to read from. And there'll be any number of scribes making copies while he's reading the text. The dictator will read each word aloud. The copying scribes will write the same word on their copies. The speed of the process depends on the lowest, the slowest scribe. Now this method produces a large amount of copies in a short amount of time, but this method is prone to inaccuracies. This is not a suitable method for copying uh, books of the Bible. Let's see what the, the problems are. The dictator may not read the word correctly, or he may mumble, and so the copying scribes may not hear it correctly and they may misunderstand. The copying scribes must keep pace with the dictator. The dictator will set the pace, but if the scribe is having trouble or he's not hearing correctly, uh, he may make a mistake there. The, the copying scribes must give their full attention to the words being read. And that has to be for every single word, and obviously that is a very tedious process. The copying scribe may mistake a similar sounding word to the one he read. Uh, so uh, he may, the word uh, sea, as in the ocean, may sound exactly like the, the word sea as looked with our eyes. So he may confuse those kind of words. A scribe, a copying scribe, recognize, if a copying scribe recognizes he had made a mistake, he might not be willing to stop the whole process in order to correct his error. So let's say uh, he sees, oh, I left out the word the in my copy. Should I stop everyone and say, hey, hold it, I'm gonna put, I need to put the word the in there. Uh, Sometimes he may not make that, if, he, if he's continually doing that, he may uh, uh, have in his mind, uh, maybe I better not do that. So uh, there's, there's these potential problems in the dictation method. So this is not a very good way of copying God's word. The best way, to, or the better way to copy God's word is the visual method. This is like a one-man job. A scribe will have in front of him the exemplar and the blank page on which he will make the copy. He will point to the word being copied with the one hand and he will write the word on the copy page, the blank page with the other hand. This method is a lot slower in making copies than the dictation method. But this method produces a very accurate copy. If a, if a scribe for, you know, he starts getting sleepy, just takes a nap, comes back, be refreshed, uh, he doesn't have to worry about the pace, he could do it on his own time. Uh, if he's trained and he concentrates, he can achieve 100% accuracy. So, uh, so that's the dictation method. And we're going to be talking about these two particular methods of copying manuscripts uh, later on in my lecture uh, and showing you what, what uh, the history of manuscripts being copied. Now let's talk about the Old Testament manuscripts. Uh, most Bible, or all Bibles today, are uh, use the uh, Leningrad Codex. This is a, a, the entire Hebrew Bible. It was copied in the year 1008, and it's in uh, uh, Russia, in the city of 
Leningrad, now called St. Petersburg. It's the oldest complete Hebrew Bible that, is, that we have. And then there's the Aleppo text, which is in Syria, and then it was taken down to Israel. And then uh, uh, in 1525, uh, they uh, a printer in Venice published the Rabbinical Bible, which is based on the same text, identical exact text as the Leningrad Codex and Aleppo Codex and the other uh, parts of the Old Testament that we have. Uh, so the, it's called the Masoretic Text because the Jews who uh, were responsible in copying it were called the Masoretic Jews. This text is entirely trustworthy and is the text used for all Bibles from the King James Version to the New American Standard to the New International Version, uh, all of them. Uh, let's talk about the discipline of the Jewish scribes. One man using the visual cop method made the copy. A copy was made from an authentic exemplar from which the transcriber cannot in the least deviate. Each page was clean and contained a uniform number of columns throughout the entire codex. A codex is a, is a book, uh, as, as opposed to a scroll. The length of each column is not less than 48 lines or more than 60 lines. The breadth of each column must consist of 30 letters. No letter or no word or letter, not even a jot or tittle, as Jesus spoke of, was written from memory. The scribe must look at every word in the exemplar text. So, with the Old Testament Hebrew Bibles, we have, uh, they have been copied precisely and uh, identically, and we have, uh, we have, we can be totally confident that uh, uh, every jot and tittle had been preserved in the Old Testament. So, at this point, I'm not going to be talking about the Old Testament anymore. The rest of my lecture will be strictly with the New Testament. Uh, those books that are uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the way through Revelation. That, that's what I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of this lecture. Okay, let's talk about the discipline of the Greek scribes. Because the New Testament was, the original language of the New Testament was Greek. So what did they do? One scribe using the visual method turned out one man manuscript on his own. The scribe worked slowly to achieve jot and tittle accuracy. Each copy was proofread by a senior scribe. Now there were penalties for making mistakes. Uh, if, if the scribe left out an accent or punctuation mark, uh, he was penalized. They told him you need to do 150 vows of repentance. That's going down on your knees and asking God for forgiveness for leaving out the punctuation mark. If he left out any words, the penalty for that scribe was uh, fasting on dry bread. Uh, finally, if he trusted his memory instead of following closely the text, the penalty was three days in seclusion. So heavy penalties were, were imposed on scribes who made mistakes. So they are really alert and paying attention. These scribes, over the course of a thousand years, uh, produced over 5,000 manuscripts. All these manuscripts are consistent with one another. Now, these now none of these manuscripts are of the whole New Testament. It's, it's beyond the capability of any person to write the whole New Testament uh, uh, word perfect, 100% accuracy. So what you have is maybe one gospel, the Gospel of Luke, or you'll have maybe, or somebody who is ambitious to have a manuscript of just four gospels, or another person may write the book of Acts, another person may have the 
sign the revelation or the letters of Paul. So, yeah, for a person to refer to the New Testament, he may have like six or seven books to have the complete New Testament. Isn't that amazing when we can have in one complete Bible not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. So, uh, there's 5,000 manuscripts, all jot and tittle accurate. Now, uh, scribes do make mistakes, even uh, the best of them. Minor errors will appear in every manuscript because copyists, no matter how careful, make mistakes. Now, the principle of the majority reading is that you can still determine God's word by comparing manuscripts and finding the reading that occurs in the majority of texts. So, uh, so if one person makes a mistake in one text, uh, it's highly unlikely that uh, the other scribes will be making the same mistake, mistake in their text. So you just compare manuscripts, and whatever is the majority reading, you can find out uh, what, is, what is God's word. Now the King James Version and the New King James are consistent with the uh, majority text. And they're the only two Bibles uh, in English that are based on the majority text. Uh, all other modern English Bibles are based on the minority text. What is the minority text? Unlike the majority text, which is based on the 5,000 manuscripts that I just described, and all 5,000 are consistent with one another, the minority text is based on very few manuscripts, all of which are inconsistent with one another. However, most Bible scholars prefer the minority text because it represents the oldest and presumably the best readings, preserved readings of God's Word. So that's the, so what, if you have any other Bible besides the King James Version or the New King James, uh, your Bible is going to be based on the minority text. The most outstanding representatives of the minority text are the Codices Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Uh, the Vatican, uh, the, a, a codex, or codices in plural, is a book, uh, just like any other book today. These books are uh, very old. They go back uh, to the 4th century AD. This is the time of the Roman Empire. Uh, let's talk about the Sinaitic text. Uh, it is one of the oldest Greek Bibles. It has both the Old and New Testaments, plus it has the Apocrypha. It was composed in the city of Caesarea in Palestine. It was not carefully uh, transcribed uh, because there's thousands of alterations on every page. Uh, this, uh, this text is uh, written on parchment. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about parchment a little bit later, but uh, parchment is sheep or calf skins, and they have choirs of eight sheets. Uh, the pages were extremely thin and delicate, about 100 to 150 microns thick. Uh, let me talk about a little about uh, parchment. Uh, I have here, oops, <laughs> uh, this is a parchment. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of, kind of like cardboard, kind of thick. Uh, this is uh, made. Uh, I got this from a, a book or pay, a parchment maker in Oregon, and it cost me twenty-two dollars for this page. So it's highly expensive stuff, and it came from a, a sheepskin, and uh, it's kind of rough on. This side, that's where the uh, the root, the hair roots were. They scraped off all the hair on this side, and on this side is smooth. That's the inner side of the skin. 
And uh, so this, uh, this, this is the parchment. Now, the parchment of the Sinaitic is a lot thinner and pliable than this stuff. So to get this to be like the copy paper, uh, they had to scrape it down more and more. It's a very laborious process. And, uh, you know, they got to have it all stretched out. Oh, thank you. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this around if you want to check it out. So with the development of parchment, a, a whole Bible uh, was then possible. Uh, the part, the uh, Sinaitic text had 743 sheets, measuring 15 by 28 inches. Uh, at least uh, 372 animal skins were needed to, or were needed to produce this codex. It was discovered in 1843 by a scholar named Tischendorf at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Desert. Now the Vaticanus is very similar. It's also dated to the fourth century. It had both Old and New Testaments, plus the Apocrypha composed in the city of Caesarea. It had alterations, but far fewer than the Sinaitic texts. It had smaller parchment sheets measuring 10 by 22 inches. Originally had 830 sheets. It had three columns instead of four. Uh, it had been completed and delivered to Constantinople, and it was acquired by the Vatican in Rome sometime in 1473. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, here's a comparison of, of New Testament manuscripts. Now, the King James Version and the New King James are all are based on those 5,000 manuscripts on the right. All our modern Bibles are based on just two, the Sinaitic and the Vatican text. Uh, they are inconsistent with the, uh, all the 5,000 manuscripts, and they're inconsistent with each other. So they have a, a lot of problems. Okay. Uh, both of those uh, manuscripts do not have the last 12 verses of Mark. Uh, all the 5,000 manuscripts you see on the right do have the last 12 verses of Mark. So, uh, uh, based on the testimony of those two manuscripts on the left, the Vatican text and the Sinaitic text, uh, your Bibles will say uh, the last 12 verses are not found in the most oldest and most reliable text. You'll see that footnote. So, uh, uh, so that's it. Here's my uh, idea of maybe how the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark could have been missed. <laughs> the big thing to describe <laughs> is reading the Gospel of Mark, he says, and he's finishing it off, he says, and confirming the word with signs following, Amen. And that concludes the Gospel of Mark. We shall begin the Gospel of Luke after lunch. <laughs> so that's my idea of how they missed the 12, last 12 verses of Mark. Okay, the Vaticanus and the Sinaitic text, they are respected and esteemed by modern scholars as being the oldest text. And they indeed they are. They are very old. Uh, they're used by modern translations as their primary text. Because of inconsistent readings of scriptural passages, textual variants have emerged. These textual variants arise when comparing a majority text with the minority text. So if you have one of those modern English Bibles, you may see in your footnotes uh, something about textual variants. Here's some examples of textual variants. Uh, in Matthew, during the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 5.44, the King James Version will say, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them 
which despitefully use you and persecute you. And then on the New American Standard says, but I say to you, love your enemies, pray for them, those who persecute you. So the King James Version, the, the bold underlying words is in all the 5,000 manuscripts that I just described. The reason why the New American Standard is shorter is because the two texts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, don't have those words in them. So in modern English Bibles, you won't see that in your text, and they'll have a footnote at the bottom of the text saying that some manuscripts have those words, or maybe a lot of cases they won't even uh, have a footnote. And then you'll see that uh, um, these other verses, I won't go through the Matthew 27, 35, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 28, Colossians 1, 14. As you can see that the, uh, uh, the 5,000 manuscripts have extra words in them that the Vaticanus text and the Sinaitic text do not have. And that's the pattern. And if you go through a critical text of the Greek Bible, you'll see uh, page after page after page of words that are missing in the Vatican text and the Sinaitic text, but are present in the 5,000 manuscripts uh, that uh, the King James and New King James are based on. So here's an example of a textual variant, Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no combination for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then, the, and then in the uh, English Standard Version, at the bottom of the page, it will say, Some manuscripts add, Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you have an English Standard Version, that's what it will say. Because of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, hundreds of textual variant footnotes can now be seen in Bibles. The question I'm asking is, does that mean that God did not preserve his word as he said he would? Remember what Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Uh, the answer, of course, is that God did preserve his word, including all the jots and tittles. So what about these textual variants? To find out, we need to go briefly into the history of the Vatican text and Sinaitic text. And so I'm kind of going to be like a, a prosecuting attorney, and I'm going to try to discredit these texts here. That, that's what I'm going to be trying to do. And uh, uh, see if you can, uh, the, uh, as I get the facts, see if you will uh, agree with me. Now, a lot of my information comes from this man. Uh, uh, he wrote a book in 1999, The Collected Biblical Writings of T.C. Skeet, uh, lived from 1907 to 2003. He worked at the British Museum. And uh, the Codex Sinaiticus was originally in Russia. And in 1933, uh, the British government purchased that Sinaitic book from the Russian government and put it in the British Library, or British Museum. And uh, he and another man, H.J.M. Uh, Milne, had the assignment of studying this codex firsthand and just, just making observations. They had no access to grind. They're just, uh, just scholars who were given the task of examining a book and seeing what they can learn from it. And he spent like 60 years studying this particular book and comparing it with other books. And he was a, a, a world-renowned scholar. And he's made a lot of contributions to our understanding of not only the Codex Sinaiticus, but also the Vaticanus text, too. According to Skeet, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus had impressive formats but inferior texts. He says they were rush jobs, 
secondly, the dictation method was used in producing them. Remember how we said the dictation method was very inaccurate? Uh, third, incompetent or careless scribes were employed in the work. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Bible manuscripts and uh, to get an understanding of what, what uh, those uh, three things are about. Okay, uh, now, uh, during Jesus' time, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, the Jews, would write their books on scrolls. So they, so like the book of Isaiah would be one scroll, the book of Genesis would be another scroll, and so you could have like um, 50 or 60 scrolls just for the Old Testament. And they would roll out the scroll and read it and continually rolling it. And that's and that was the, the way that people used to uh, uh, read, this, uh, read the Old Testament. And that's what they were copying back in those days. Now, uh, in the... Uh, the interesting thing about the Christians is they didn't use scrolls at all. Every fragment that we have of New Testament books were written in codices. And codices is just like our books today. Uh, they had covers, they had pages, they were written on both sides. Uh, uh, people have uh, wondered why Christians, the, the Christians practically invented the book. The books, nobody ever seen a book until Christians came along. And uh, so uh, people wondered, well, why did Christians uh, not go with the scrolls and start going with the books? And that's, uh, maybe there's some leader within the church that uh, thought this was a better way of doing it, or maybe, uh, but anyway, coded, coded uh, books or codexes, codices were invented by Christians, and that's what they used exclusively from, from, the, from, from the first century on. Now, uh, the codices that they used were on these uh, papyrus sheets. And this is an example of Egyptian papyrus. It's only a dollar, so it's... <laughs> and uh, it's made from uh, the papyrus reed, and they would write and if it's and it uh, has this tendency to roll up, and so this is great for, for scrolls. But the Christians would uh, fold it in half and make sheets of it and put it in codices. And so, uh, and as you can see, the thickness of the page is uh, would prevent you from putting a lot of material in one book. So, one codex will have the Gospel of John. Another codex will have the epistles of Paul. So, uh, so uh, due to due to the uh, material, you can't put more in one book than maybe at most four gospels. So, uh, I'll pass this around if you guys want to check it out. Okay, now we're going to the next slide: uh, history of Bible texts. The first. Codices were single choir books with pages made out of papyrus. What is a choir? Okay, so if I fold these pages in half and put a cover on it, this is this is a quad, single choir. If I get more pages, I'd have two choirs in the, in the book. And, and if you could have as many as 50. Now, the Codex Sinaiticus had like uh, something like 80 choirs. So, uh, uh, and the first codices contained one book of the Bible, such as the Gospel of John. And then they started going with parchment codices. And parchment sheets were thinner than papyrus. A lot more material could be written, and uh, uh, this, and finally, with the invention of parchment, 
uh, this is about 300 years after Christ, uh, a one volume Bible was now possible. So, uh, so let's talk about parchment. The parchment, uh, a man will come up to a sheep and kill it, and he will take the skins, and, and one sheep will have two parchment uh, sheets. And uh, then he will stretch it out on a frame, and then he will clean it and scrape it down to the desired thinness, and then uh, cut it to uh, uh, a rectangular form. Now this man is very interesting. He's going to—he's very important to our discussion. Emperor Constantine. He was a Roman emperor from 306 to 337 AD. He was the first Christian emperor. He moved the capital of the empire from Rome to Byzantium, which is uh, now Istanbul of Turkey, and he renamed it uh, Constantinople. Uh, he built the Holy Sepulchre of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. Uh, where Jesus was uh, uh, buried. Uh, Constantine, when he established his city, uh, was constructing all uh, like 50 churches around the city. And he wanted 50 Bibles for these churches. And he wanted these Bibles to contain the Old and New Testaments plus the Apocrypha. He said he wanted it as speedily as possible. He said all 50 Bibles must arrive in one shipment at his palace for his inspection. No expense would be spared for this project. This, uh, this is, uh, and the man in charge of this was uh, Eusebius of Caesarea. The magnitude of the task was just gigantic. No one had ever seen a whole Bible before. The project had to be planned out and executed very carefully. Expert calligraphers had to be found who could do the work. The, and and uh, there's about four million characters that had to be written for each Bible with all the jots and tittles. And precisely ordered in neat columns. Uh, and somehow he had to get this out as speedily as possible. So, uh, furthermore, the parchment product production had to be scaled up to turn out a huge number of sheets. Poor sheep. All these poor sheep had to get done. Over 300 sheep were needed to make one Bible required by Constantine. Just one. And he wanted 50 of these things. So multiply 50 to 300. So, uh, so let's. Uh, I got here a sample. This is uh, the Bible that uh, Constantine was uh, interested in getting. This is uh, the Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, this is the size it would be. Uh, I think it's. Uh, uh, 15 by 28 inches. So when I open it up, it's a very, this is very impressive the way, the way it would look for an emperor. And it has four columns of uh, handwritten script all the way through, and it's on both sides. Now what makes it complicated for the scribes is, remember they're choirs, okay, so, uh, so you would have like page one and page two, and then this would be page 31, page 32. The next sheet will be page two and three, and 29 and 30. The next one will be, so, so if you're a scribe and you're writing out the book of Genesis, you would have to stop at page two, and go to another sheet to stoop three and four, and you have to have it all organized and laid out in such a way. And, it, and this is a, an eight sheet choir, so you get uh, 32 pages. So it, this is a really complicated thing to do to make a book like that. 
so, uh, and plus, oh, and, and here, and then I have the, uh, the Vaticanus text, and as you can see, it's a, it's a smaller uh, format. Why is it in a smaller format? Uh, well, they found out that if they put it in a smaller size, you can get uh, four of these sheets off of one panel versus two using the bigger format. So, so that's why they, they went to this format. Uh, this, by going to this size, they say labor, they say cost, and most importantly, say time. Because the Con Constantine wanted it right like now. <laughs> and the poor sheep. <laughs> um, I'd like to read something here that Steve wrote uh, about uh, Constantine. Uh, let's say you were Eusebius and you were given this project. How would how would you feel? Uh, he, and he's, this is Steve, and, he's, and I'm quoting him. Here we must reflect on the general circumstances of the case. Constantine was a military man, accustomed to instant obedience to his orders. He was moreover liable to sudden fits of anger in which he committed appalling cruelties. Perhaps therefore we can sympathize with Eusebius' feelings on receiving the emperor's uh, letter and noting that the 50 Bibles were to be prepared as soon as possible and conveyed to the capital in two specially commanded wagons. Faced with the task of getting scribes to copy something like 200 million uh, characters, he would no doubt have impressed every scribe whose hand would pass muster and put them to work almost day and night. Uh, then uh, here's something else uh, I'm going to quote. We can now see why Eusebius mentions the fact Constantine clearly expected all 50 Bibles to be sent off together. So, uh, but uh, Eusebius realized that was going to uh, be too much of a delay to have all 50 Bibles done at one time. So somehow, uh, he convinced him for to have shipments of not uh, shipments of three or four Bibles instead of fifty all at once until they get up to the number fifty. And the reason why he did that, he, he said, Skeet says, the answer I think lies in the urgency of the occasion, knowing the emperor's character and realizing, as the emperor doubtless did not, the enormous task before him. Eusebius uh, may well have sent off the volumes as and when they were completed instead of waiting for the last one to be finished and risking an outburst of the emperor's wrath. So uh, Eusebius was under the gun. Okay, uh, Constantine could not tolerate delays, so Eusebius had to uh, step up the production and he requested the order of uh, three ship, smaller shipments of three and fours. And instead of the visual method, which was very slow, Eusebius uh, had his scribes use the uh, dictation method to get more Bibles out. The scribes were required to be alert for many hours, tediously copying millions of words, uh, millions of words from the dictator. A lot of inaccuracies was a consequence of using this method. Uh, and here's another problem with the dictation method. The, uh, the Greek language in Constantine's time, the, pr the pronunciation of the words had dramatically shifted so that uh, people did not pronounce the words in the same way as people did back in the Apostles' time. Uh, vowels and diphthongs became indistinguishable through a process called ioticism. Another problem was the merging of sounds of some consonants.
Scribes had to be trained in Greek, Cornea Greek, to preserve jot until accuracy. So let's have an example here of, next slide, uh, for example, the name David, you know, David the King in the New Testament, spelled D-A-B-I-D. -D. Uh, it could also be spelled D-A-B-I-D -D because the, the B letter no longer had that B sound that it had during the Apostles' time. It now sounded like a B. So you could spell the name David with the B now. And in modern uh, Greek, that's still the same. They don't have the B sound. They have the B sound. So instead of saying uh, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, they'll say Alpha, Beta, Gamma. And the letter B is gone. And they replaced it with the TH sound. Alpha, alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. So, so the merging of consonants was a problem in their day. And uh, it caused huge confusion with the the dictation method on these two texts, the Sinaitic text and the Vaticanical text. In Constantine's time, the letters Yota, Ita, and Ipsilon, those three letters at the top, and then those, there's uh, digraphs, the two vowels, uh, they were all distinguishable sounds in the Apostles' time, but during Constantine's time, they're all the same. They have that E sound. And that's the same in modern Greek today. They don't have those distinguishing vowels for all those. So that caused a great confusion there, too. Incompetence of one of the scribes. One of the scribes was so bad that the first Bible they did, which was the Sinaitic text, uh, was so full of errors and marginal corrections that it had to be abandoned. The Sinaitic text was never finished, never bound, never sent to the emperor, and at that point, uh, they got rid of that one scribe. Let me, let me tell you what uh, Steve says about the scribe here. Uh, uh, it he's talking about the dictation method. He follows that the dictation opened the floodgates to all kinds of corruptions, unless the scribe had a thorough grounding in spelling. In the case of the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, one scribe evidently possessed this important advantage, for his spelling is practically beyond reproach. Uh, the other, uh, another scribe uh, didn't have any difficulty, but there was a scribe designated Scribe B uh, that had all records are broken. In fact, the real difficulty is to understand why uh, this particular scribe could ever have been chosen for the work. Not only is he completely lost with vowels and consonants alike, but his writings are disfigured by gratuitous blunders of the crudest kind. So, uh, so to conclu conclude my talk here, in summary, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus should be rejected as suitable texts for scripture. They were rush jobs. Whenever, whenever uh, Constantine wanted these books out as quickly as possible, and whenever uh, speed becomes a priority, accuracy always suffers. So if you're, let's say you're writing out something and you had to write it out as quickly as possible, you're going to make lots of mistakes. If you, if you took your time and did it well, you're going to not make those mistakes. Secondly, the dictation method was used. All sorts of confusion was uh, created with that. And finally, incompetent or careless scribes were employed. So once we remove the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus from consideration, there I'm putting that X through the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, our modern English Bibles will go to the 5,000 manuscripts all consistent with one another for their primary text. Next slide. The textual variants will all disappear. 
in all modern English Bibles will read pretty much the same as the King James Version or the New King James, which are very accurate and reliable translations. So, uh, so in conclusion, I would recommend that, uh, that you would uh, consider getting a King James Bible if you don't want, have one already. Thank you for your time. <laughs>